What is the difference between the perception of beauty and aesthetics of the past, say like 15th or 16th century and today? And how will this perception shape in the future, in your opinion? Uh, good. So, uh, so that's a big, huge question and lots of uh, you know, art historians are clearly very much interested in this. So if you're an art historian and you're studying, I don't know, Ottoman painting, uh, then, um, then it's in some sense, you would have to understand how people in the Ottoman period were experiencing these paintings. So in, in, in some sense, and there's some um, influential art historians, uh, some old school art historians who think that that is the big question of art history. That's the biggest question of art history, try to figure out how people saw the world or saw paintings in all in in um, in earlier historical periods um and then that makes this question kind of a philosophy of perception question it's a question about perception a question about uh, how experience changes and what i think is that um i i, I think we, we might have some reason to think that people actually did experience things differently in the i don't know 15th century than they do now and but the problem is that they're not here so we can't really ask them uh, but they they did write a lot of things uh, in the 15th century, so we can have some kind of uh, idea about what, how they might have experienced things. I mean, so we have some some reasons from um, from what we know about the way the mind works, so the main our, the way our, our brain is set up uh, that might help with this. So uh, here's a big important consideration what we experience or how we see the world very much depends not just on, you know, what hits our retina, the, the light that hits our retina. It also depends on various background beliefs, background assumptions, background um, knowledge that we have about the world. So we're gonna, we, we will literally see things differently depending on, uh, not just on, on what's on our retina, but, but also uh, on our background mental states, beliefs, desires, expectations. And given that these beliefs, desires, expectations were very different in the 14th century than they are now, then the whole experience is going to be very different now than it was in the 14th century. Um, and, you know, and if that's true, then probably in the future, we're also going to see things or experience things differently, which is a bit of a kind of a, a humbling perspective, right? I mean, so you make an artwork now for the audience that will experience it in a certain way that you can extrapolate from the way you're experiencing it. But maybe people in the future are going to experience things very differently. So in the 14th century, when people made these little paintings, uh, they were uh, trying to make these paintings in a way that they would be experienced in some ways in their contemporaries back in the 14th century. But we, in the 21st century, we might actually, when we look at those paintings, we might have completely different kind of experience. Of work. So that, that, gives, that might give you a bit of a... Um, a um, a sense of humility about just how much we can really engage with an, um, an artwork. Okay, thank you, Professor. And and do we have mathematical instinct of co um, instinct of beauty? Mm, sorry, uh, do we have mathematical instinct of what we call beautiful, or uh, do we have identify somewhere regarding to golden rule instinctly? Uh, so the question is about the mathematical it, it, golden rule. I mean, do we that we can mathemat mathematize the our aesthetic experiences? That we can have some mathematical rules about what we find aesthetically mm -hmm. pleasing and what we don't. No, uh -huh. I mean, what, why we were while we were calling somebody is beautiful? Do we have uh, some unconscious uh, backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, uh, regarding on uh, symmetry and golden rule? by calling somebody beautiful do we oh. have okay good uh right so so i think no not at all and and part of the part of the answer is 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 what i said in response to the previous previous question so uh if it is really true that much of our experience will be influenced by uh our background knowledge and beliefs that is go that's going to be culturally specific so if you grow up in a different culture then these these things are going to be very different partly because the, the kind of faces that you've seen before, the kind of scenes that you've seen before will have been different and that's going to influence the way you experience what you experience now. Mm -hmm. So because of this, it's going to be very difficult to come up with any kind of universal rules of what we find beautiful. 
um, and and that's been a big game in in this uh, discipline of um, of psychology called empirical aesthetics, where they do a lot of experiments on how, what what we find beautiful. There's some reason to think that symmetry might be something that that's beautiful. There's a there's a lot of is issues with that general paradigm, um, and and, uh, and I'm not you know some of my best friends are empirical aestheticians, so I don't I don't want to dismiss that that discipline. Uh, but but I think one really important consideration that um, maybe it would be a good idea for that whole discipline to take more seriously is the cultural variations of what we find beautiful and what we don't. So uh, so people in different parts of the world who have been who have well not just different parts but different parts of even a country. So uh, you know I, I spent some time in eastern Turkey. Uh, the visual stimuli that you that you encounter when you're in a um, in a in a village in a, near Kars, uh, it's going to be very different from the visual input that you that you encounter in Istanbul. Um, so so you um, so because of that, you're going to have very different sensitivity to very different kinds of stimuli. So you can't you have no reason to think that your uh, your um, your aesthetic reaction can be fully somehow understood on a mathematical basis. Sure, there might be some kind of mathematical influence on, for example, things like symmetry. Uh, that are just very very simple uh, properties, but but I think you can't understand, uh, can't even begin to understand the full scope of aesthetic reaction on these kind of uh -huh. mathematical universalist basis. Thank you, Professor. Um, our uh, um, our understanding of beautiful is something that is formed by our perception, or as you said before, our expectations, like living condition, and. What do you think, which tools are used to manipulate the perception of the public and how does an industry or advertising or media generate our subliminal forces? Good, that's a big question. So, um, so, so the short answer is that yes, this is a uh, perception can very much be manipulated and, it, and all of our perception is constantly manipulated like, all the time by uh, not just by artworks, but by the by the mass media and by our Facebook feed or by your Twitter feed, and uh, and this is this is not something that we can do much against or, or about. Um, I think when it gets really dangerous is when they uh, when when there's a link between this kind of perceptual manipulation and the manipulation of your preferences and desires. Uh, which is exactly what advertising is trying to do, right? It's trying to get you to have desires to buy a certain product that kind of bypasses your um, you know, your psychological immune system, uh, your um, your your beliefs and values, um, partly by perceptual means, by giving you perceptual stimuli that uh, that that's going to kind of directly lead to a desire without any kind of mediation of your uh, of your beliefs. Um, so that's a um, it's a big danger, but uh, I'm not sure we can do much about it. And uh, you know, other than uh, switch off our TV and uh, chuck away all our electronic devices. Thank you. Um, what can you say about the evolution of our perception of beauty? What kind of differences and similarities between our ancestors and us regarding uh, the subject of perception of beauty, like? What kind of foundations have stayed the same? What kind of details have gradually faded? Okay, so it's a historical question. Yeah, so, so, um, so, so I said something before about how, um, how our experience of artworks and experience of, of, of um, not just artworks, but also everyday scenes, they have changed. Um, throughout history and they might you know when you looked at the same painting in the 14th century you might have experienced something different from what you're experiencing now um, because all kinds of other parts of your uh, mind are just very different for a 14th century observer and for a, for a 21st century observer but there's an extra thing and maybe that's what you're asking here about and there's an extra thing and that's um and then i have to bring in this concept of aesthetic experience that um I, I like uh, I like to talk about. Um, so I'm sure that you can all remember your, you know, remember a lot of aesthetic experiences of yours, like strong aesthetic experiences when something just really, I don't know, you maybe you you um, you listen to music and it's just really talked to you in some sense. It really shook you. It really kind of blew you away. 
um, or uh, you went to a, to a museum and then you looked at the, a painting and it's just really, you felt some kind of personal connection. So aesthetic experience, I think, is, is a really important concept. And that's the main reason why we spend all this money and time on, on aesthetic endeavors. And we really spend a lot of money and time on aesthetic endeavors. Um, but just what aesthetic experience is, is again, I don't think that there's a kind of some kind of universal conception that's true for all time periods and, and uh, uh, that was the same in the 14th century and the same now, and it's gonna be the same in 200 years. Uh, and, and I think there's certain kind of cultural specificity or, or temporal specificity in what we consider to be an aesthetic experience. And there's been a very influential form of aesthetic experience that lots of people are uh, writing about in the last hundred years or so, or maybe longer. Um, and, um, and, and, I, and I think that we can have a, a fairly interesting account of what that is, but it's important to know that that is not just the, that, that's not the only kind of aesthetic experience there is. And probably people in the 14th century didn't have that kind of aesthetic experience. This, this aesthetic experience that somehow involves some kind of detached perceptions that you're detached in, in some way that you're, it's, it, you're perceiving something in a detached manner and uh, in a contemplative manner or something like that. Uh, so that's, um, that's, that's, again, that is some kind of very uh, cultural specific and very time specific uh, concept. I mean, it, it, may, it might be on its way out. It might, we might not have that kind of experience in a in hundred years. Maybe our kids are not gonna have that kind of experience. Should be a shame, but I'm sure that they're gonna have some other kind of experience. Thank you, Professor.